is a state secret. These systems are magic, as far as I'm concerned. They are extraordinarily powerful, and I just don't think it makes sense in this era for that information and those technical capabilities to be widely known throughout the world. In an ideal world, there would be no reason for us to protect this information, but it isn't an ideal world. Satellite now entering target area. But secrecy won't stop people from guessing. This is Hollywood's best attempt at portraying spy satellites in action. Here, CIA agents watch a British raid on a terrorist camp as it happens via real-time infrared imagery. We all rush to those movies to see exactly what they're thinking because it's always interesting to sort of see are they leading us or are we leading them. Suffice it to say, we are, are moving information worldwide very quickly that allows the U.S. to have a very capable intelligence system that's made of, of land-based, sea-based, and space-based sensors. And if you take all of these kinds of capabilities and put them together, it's something that I think the citizens of the U.S. can be quite proud of. How real is it? Insiders say the pictures look right. The political side of this, obviously, there's been a change in Cuba policy under President Trump last year, which would be under President Obama. So I just want everyone, everyone to understand the timing here. When we are talking about acoustic attack, Bob, or sonic weapons, what are we talking about? Well, Aaron, the, the, the Cubans and the Russians have been doing this for years, attacking our embassies in Moscow, in Amman, Jordan. Uh, they use various techniques, uh, microwave, they'll bombard a, a window with microwave and they can pick up acoustics. Uh, they've even done it with radiation where you can read documents by radiating a room. Uh, they've done it with laser microphones and what that does is you shoot it at let's say a styrofoam cup on a desk and it will take that audio and send it back across the laser. So it could be any one of these things. The Russians have been experimenting with this for years, and we've been aware of it. It's very, very difficult to prove, and that's why we probably haven't gone to the Cubans with definitive proof. But you know, in a place like Havana, it's not going to be the Germans or somebody like that bombarding our embassy. It's either going to be the Cubans or the Russians possibly working together. All right, so... This next story is so unbelievable, we didn't think it could possibly be true. But after receiving thousands of records and declassified reports from the Army, it's confirmed that during the Cold War, the United States military conducted secret tests on unsuspecting people in the city of St. Louis. A local sociologist will make her findings public tomorrow, but she spoke first to the I-team's Lisa Zygman. Lisa Martino Taylor's life work has been to uncover details of the Army's ultra secret military experiments carried out in St. Louis and other cities during the 1950s and 60s. This study was secretive for a reason. Um, they didn't have um, volunteers stepping up and saying, Yeah, I'll breathe zinc cadmium sulfide with radioactive particles. These Army archive pictures show how the tests were done in Corpus Christi, Texas in the 1960s. In Texas, planes were used to drop the chemical, but in St. Louis, the Army placed chemical sprayers on buildings and station wagons. City officials were kept in the dark about the tests. The Cold War cover story was that the Army was testing smoke screens to protect cities from a Russian attack. The truth, according to Martino Taylor, was much more sinister. It's pretty shocking. Um, the level of duplicity and secrecy. Um, um, clearly, they went to great lengths to deceive people. Eleven hundred meters. Your location is Whiskey Delta.
But when it comes to what else these satellites are doing? The specifics as to what it can detect are classified, unfortunately. This guy is controlling his friend like a video game character. This thing is so cool and I so want to try it. I would put it on all of my children and see if I could get them to do chores. Hey, it's bedtime. <laughs> we went to meet Alan to find out how he made a sci-fi superpower into an awesome reality. I made it out of a remote control toy car, basically, and now I can remotely control people who agree to wear this thing. Walk with me. Wow. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's so bizarre. The reactions were actually uh, very fearful. People didn't like the idea of messing with someone's brain, so a lot of people were sort of like icked out by the whole thing. They thought it was kind of scary. Uh, which I think is really funny. <laughs> what are you doing? It's controlling oh, it. Wow. So how can you take over someone else's mind? <laughs> Alan is controlling his friends using their vestibular system that's responsible for balance. Small canals in your inner ear move fluid around, and as that fluid sloshes back and forth, it excites hairs which send electrical signals into the brain. Alan's helmet is able to override those signals. OK, oh, OK. Two copper-plated electrodes are fitted to the side of the helmet, ready to shock the wearer. By hitting the left button on the remote control, the electrical current is sent to the right side of the helmet. When this happens, the brain tries to compensate by leaning the body in the opposite direction. Alan's helmet is able to trick the wearer into believing that ground is in a different direction. Oh, oh gosh. <laughs> oh, gosh. If all of a sudden the ground shifts beneath you, you walk in the direction to try and stabilize. I'm being pulled. <laughs> I'm being pulled over in that direction. Being able to push left on a joystick on a controller and then seeing the person in front of you immediately start turning to the left, um, it's, it's kind of a power trip. <laughs> Thanks, Alan. We'll let you get back to abusing your power over your friends. <laughs> If these private people were, were holding a conversation and used keywords that is in the, in the computer's dictionary, then that individual would become a target. Yes, all you have to do is, is key the computer and you are now a target. Signals that carry our telecommunications between cities travel in straight lines between antennas spaced generally 30 to 50 kilometers apart. These two can be picked up. Towards the end of the 1960s, the Americans realized that most of the energy from these microwave links went past the target station and went into space. And if you could put a listening satellite in the right position in space, you could hear all of those communications between the cities.
Given the success of satellite interceptions, the Americans developed other space vessels capable of targeting on demand our mobile phones, pagers, and computer data. Their code names are Trumpet, Mercury, Advanced Mercury. Their antennas unfold like vast umbrellas, reaching up to 100 meters in diameter. Each one costs one billion dollars. America is the only country in the world to possess such electronic surveillance capabilities. Even its partners have only partial access to it. His name is Porter Goss. He's a congressman from Florida. Uh, how, how can one assume that somebody who actually used to work in that type of environment for the CIA is going to exercise any proper oversight over what any of the intelligence agencies are doing, including the NSA. In Canada, there's no governmental oversight on the communication security establishment at all. This has been one of the things I've been asking for for a number of years now. Uh, I believe they should have proper oversight and accountability to our own government. It's supposed to be a Canadian agency. This doesn't seem to be in place. As a matter of fact, it isn't in place. Uh, the only knowledge I have of them answering to anybody is simply the NSA and strictly the NSA. They're the only ones they take their answers from. I think people are basically kind of lackadaisical about it. They're kind of asleep. Um, they'll say, I don't have anything to hide. Why am I worried? Why should I be worried about it? Well, with that kind of attitude, you, that person may wake up some morning and find out it's too late to do anything. And what they thought was, the case, I'm not doing anything wrong, it may one day be illegal, but then it's too late to do anything about it. From the White House in the office of the President of the United States, we present an address by Dwight D. Eisenhower. This is the farewell address for President Eisenhower, whose eight years as Chief Executive come to an end at noon Friday. Mr. Eisenhower has chosen this time for his final speech. Ladies and gentlemen, he put his stamp on every one of them. You see a lot of typewriting, but you see even more handwriting, and all of it is Eisenhower's. Eisenhower knew it was going to be big, because you don't do 21 drafts on a speech for a farewell address if you didn't want to make a very great statement. He needed to get it right, because this speech wasn't just meant for Kennedy, it was meant for posterity. A vital element in keeping the peace is our military establishment. When Dwight David Eisenhower went before the camera to deliver his farewell address on January 17, 1961, it was his last chance to speak to all of America as president. This evening, I come to you with a message of leave-taking and farewell. From beginning to end, it was just about 16 minutes but it expressed a lifetime of experience. We yet realize that America's leadership and prestige depend not merely upon our unmatched material progress, riches, and military strength, but on how we use our power in the interest of world peace and human betterment. After seeing JFK warn of a missile gap, Ike felt he had reason to fear this young president might commit our military to unworthy goals, perhaps even be itching for a fight. Disarmament with mutual honor and confidence is a continuing imperative. One thing Eisenhower and Khrushchev had agreed upon was no one could win a nuclear war. And Eisenhower was desperate to move America off any path that would end in such destruction. As one who knows that another war could utterly destroy this civilization, I wish I could say tonight that a lasting peace is in sight, but so much remains to be done. Then came the moment in the speech that is most remembered. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. It was all the more powerful coming from the general who had run World War II. I had seen a new industry rising up alongside America's powerful military, 
The suppliers of submarines, missiles, jet fighters, radars, and so on, had their own interests. Until the latest of our world conflicts, the United States had no armaments industry. American makers of plowshares could, with time and as required, make swords as well. We have been compelled to create a permanent armaments industry of vast proportions. This is a point many miss, who use the military-industrial complex as a rallying cry against both sides of the phrase. Ike understood not only that we had a large military and corporations to supply it, but that this arrangement was necessary. The problem, whether there was undue influence. The goal, proper balance. With the phrase military-industrial complex, Ike was saying something subtle and measured, not simply a slogan. America had, in the past, feared a large standing army becoming its own power base. But now the nation had to reconcile itself to a new era. Only an alert and knowledgeable citizenry can compel the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machinery of defense with our peaceful methods and goals so that security and liberty may prosper together. Further, the threat was not just the military and the arms industry. Government and science also presented a tricky relationship. The prospect of domination of the nation's scholars by federal employment, project allocations, and the power of money is ever present and is gravely to be regarded. We must also be alert to the equal and opposite danger that public policy could itself become the captive of a scientific, technological elite. So this complex Eisenhower referred to was actually more complex than many thought. Sort of a military, industrial, congressional, scientific complex. He didn't say congressional because he was probably persuaded not to, even though he felt it, I would say, Congress would not have appreciated that one bit. And yet, that's where it was. In its day, Ike's farewell address did not receive anywhere near the fanfare. So you, re you can reassure people you're not looking for some kind of conflict in Iran. And well, I'm the one that talks about these wars that are 19 years and people are just there. And don't kid yourself, you do have a military industrial complex. They do like war. You know, in Syria with the caliphate. So I wipe out 100% of the caliphate. That yeah. doesn't mean you're not going to have these crazy people going around blowing up stores and blowing up things. These are seriously ill people. I don't want to say, oh, they're wiped out, you know, ISIS. But I wiped out 100% of the caliphate. I say, I want to bring our troops back home. The place went crazy. They want to keep, they, you have people here in Washington. They, want it. they never want to leave. I say, you know what I'll do? I'll leave a couple of hundred soldiers behind. But if it was up to them, they'd bring thousands of soldiers in. Someday people will explain it. Well, this but, is an but example. But you do have, you do have a group, and they call it the military industrial complex. They never want to leave. They always want to fight. No, I don't want to fight. But you do have situations like Iran. You can't let them have nuclear okay. weapons. You just can't let that happen. So that's an example, I think, of what people liked in 2016, where you didn't come over as I haven't a traditional changed. Republican. No, but right? I haven't changed. And that, well, that take kind a look. Of, that's what we talk about on our show, the sure. popular. I just want to go I through gave a couple them, of... I gave the generals, I said, go ahead, you got one year, see what you can do in Afghanistan. So they fight and fight and fight. But, you know, we've taken it way down in Afghanistan. I don't know if you've seen that, Steve. We've taken it way down. Now, it's a rough place. It's a bad place. A lot of bad things happen. The World Trade Center bombers were sort of... That's like the Harvard University right. of terrorism, OK? If you want to be a terrorist, you go over there, OK? But, uh, no, we... I, I, I have not changed. The uh, topic today is an adversary that poses a threat, serious threat to security of the United States of America. This adversary is one of the world's last bastions of central planning. It governs by dictating five-year plans from a single capital that attempts to impose its command across time zones, continents, oceans, and beyond. With brutal consistency, it stifles free thought and crushes new ideas. It disrupts.
disrupts the defense of the United States and places the lives of men and women in uniform at risk. On September 10th, 2001, Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld declared a new war. Not a war on a shadowy terrorist organization in Afghanistan, or even a war on terror itself, but a war on the Pentagon. The adversary is closer to home. It's the Pentagon bureaucracy. Perhaps it is no surprise that Rumsfeld felt compelled to declare a war on the Pentagon's bureaucracy. The issue of the Pentagon's $2.3 trillion accounting nightmare had been dogging him since his confirmation hearings in January of 2001. Although Rumsfeld was interested in pushing forward a modernization of the military that was projected to cost an additional $50 billion in funding, that agenda was politically impossible in the face of the Department of Defense's monumental budget problem. How can we seriously consider a $50 billion increase in the defense budget when DOD's own auditors, when DOD's own auditors, say the department cannot account for $2.3 trillion in transactions in one year alone. Now, my question to you is, Mr. Secretary, what do you plan to do about this? Decline the nomination. (laughs) 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 Oh, uh, Senator, I have heard... I don't want to see you do that. We'll stand adjourned in that case. <laughs> <laughs> Senator, I have heard some of that and read some of that, um, that the department is not capable of auditing its books. It, it is... Um, I was going to say terrifying... Instead of bolting from me, just sort of ambled off. You know, at a reasonable pace into the forest, and I started to follow him. I don't know, they'd been running away for so long. I think I almost started to cry. Um, After all that hard work, finally somebody, you know, permitted me to, to be with them. My best estimate at the time was more than 140 chimps, which was far more than the largest previously known community anywhere. Why do they hunt? One old idea is that they hunt when they're hungry, when there isn't a lot of fruit around. But as things turn out, it's exactly the opposite. The monkey gets out on a small branch and he's momentarily trying to decide what to do. Another chimpanzee comes from an adjacent tree, jumps onto the other end of the bow, runs at the monkey from behind, grabs him. I got one. I was standing maybe 15 feet from them, watching this great male chimpanzees, each took an arm or a leg, and they literally started drawing and quartering this monkey. Here, here's a leg, it's yours. One morning I went out and found Heron Ellington, not with anyone else. It was not uncommon that the two of them would be together all day long. The fact that these killers can also be very peaceful, very tranquil, very cooperative. I think it just shows how complex these animals are and really how similar they are to to humans. Bill and I were following about eight or so of the males, 
grooming in a path. We were way out to the west. And we heard someone scream. David and I, you know, kind of looked at one another and it was like, oh, excitement. I briefly was thinking, why were they so upset? What's going on? <laughs> and we arrived on this scene. They actually attacked one of their own. Brown face and Pinter and most, but not all of the Ngogo chimpanzees were attacking someone. <laughs> And then I quickly realized they were attacking Grappelli and that he was in real trouble. They beat him, kicked him off. Following the attack, um, which was brutal, um, Grappelli climbed a tree. It, there's no way an, another animal could survive that. When I heard that Hare was the one chimp who had offered some comfort, some solicitation, some support against the attackers, that didn't surprise me at all. He's obviously a very interesting chimp in so many different ways. When the first to tolerate us as humans, have this kinder, gentler side to him, which is quite unusual for a male chimpanzee. Ellington died. There was a conspicuous absence. Hare was previously a very social chimp who liked to hang around with these big groups of males. But Hare would just show up, seem to, to look around, look at the other chimps, as if he was looking for Ellington, but then not stay for very long and go on his way. I was getting the impression that, you know, Hare was depressed, didn't want to hang out with other chimps, and that he was really, for a while, really searching for his longtime friend. course of 10 years, they had killed so many members from that neighboring community that they had reduced the coalitionary strength of that neighboring group to an extent where our chimps could simply move in and make this big land grab and expand their territory in a quite significant way. 